I like this time of year. It's a time of year when there's a lot of celebrating going on. But you know, I don't know if you realize it or not, but really not very many people are really celebrating the birth of Christ. They're really not. The world is celebrating Xmas, not Christmas. My wife teaches the third grade, and she asked the third graders to illustrate by a picture what Christmas means to them. She said, draw a little picture of what Christmas means to you. And out of every student she had, not a one of them mentioned Christ. It was Christmas presents, Christmas trees, uh, uh, Christmas dinners, that sort of thing. Not a one of them <coughs> thought to draw a manger scene or anything that had to do with Christ. Now keep this in mind. The world doesn't celebrate Christmas. They don't celebrate Christmas. Only Christians can really celebrate Christmas. Jason works at TU. I don't know what he does over there. He's over all day, but he does something with the computers, program them and straighten them out. And, but anyway, he noticed on all the computers there at TU, someone had left messages on each computer saying something about, we're closed for Xmas. Or uh, something about Xmas on there. It was some kind of an announcement so that, or the computers will all be down through Xmas. And I don't know how many hours it took him, but he went in there and reprogrammed every one of those computers and put Christmas on it. He said, he said, <laughs> hey, hey, hey. And they paid him $7.95 an hour to do it. And they didn't even know what he was doing. But he said, hey, I'm putting Christ back in Christmas. And he put Christ back in every one of those computers. And so I'm a little bit proud of him. Jason, come down and take a bath. No, he didn't. He don't want to do that. I appreciate Jason. And, uh, but the world doesn't really celebrate Christmas. We don't understand Christmas. Do you realize that we don't really understand Christmas? We might understand Christmas, but we can't really comprehend Christmas. We, we celebrate the birth of Christ, which is the incarnation. We don't celebrate the birth of God. <laughs> God is eternal. But what we celebrate is the fact that God, uh, all-powerful, almighty God, at one time came down to planet Earth and took on human flesh. That's what we celebrate. And you see, that really can't start joy bells in your heart until you understand the whole reason for him doing that. But we really can't comprehend that. I can't. I understand it, but I can't comprehend it. I understand that God is eternal and he always existed, but I can't comprehend that. I understand that space goes on forever and forever and forever and forever, but I can't comprehend that. My mind can't comprehend that. And I cannot, for the life of me, comprehend God coming down, creator God coming down and being born as a little baby in a manger. I can't comprehend that. You see, Jesus was very man, but also very God. That means that he was 100% human, but he was at the same time 100% God. Now, I don't feel too bad about it because, you see, his own mother couldn't understand that. His own father couldn't understand the incarnation. The very disciples that he trained and lived with for three years could not really comprehend this man, Jesus, is creator God. They could not understand that. And you'd think they would be able to. They observed all the miracles he watched, but still they couldn't understand. They couldn't comprehend this is God in human flesh. One time Jesus was... And the disciples were crossing the sea, and it says that Jesus was very weary, and he laid down in the ship and went to sleep. And a great storm come, and the storm was such that waves were coming over the sides of the boat. And all the disciples were scared to death, and they woke him up and said, Master, do you not care that we perish? And Jesus stood up and said, Oh, ye of little faith. And he said to the wind and the waves, Peace be still, and they just and it said they all were astonished 
and said, What manner of man is this that even the waves obey him? He's God. He's God. Now I want to read something to you in John, St. John, and I'm going to be skipping around a little bit because of time. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now notice this. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He came into his own. Oh, now notice this. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we find that, you see, Christ always existed. There was always the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, my, my kids, uh, Shannon and Jason, they love Star Trek. Star Trek. What, how many know what that is? Well, I, I don't watch it. I don't like those kind of programs, but boy, they won't miss it when it's on. But uh, I've seen it enough to know that one thing they do, they'll be on a spaceship and they'll jump in a little old capsule and they'll say, beam me down, Scotty, and phew, he's gone. I can just kind of see, there's the Godhead. There's a little virgin. The Holy Spirit overshadows her. I can almost hear the Lord say to Gabriel, beam me down, Gabriel. <laughs> God, creator, came to planet Earth. He was born in a manger. Isn't it amazing? Now, he was born in Bethlehem of Judea. I mean, Bethlehem of Judea, of all... Listen, he created everything that's created, and he was born in Bethlehem of Judea. That's like being born in Peru. <laughs> or Osage. Or, I'm not making fun of Peru. But all I'm saying is that there was just a little bitty town, a very insignificant town, other than for the fact that's where King David was born. And he's the son of David. Now that's very insignificant. Also, other than Bethlehem means house of bread. And he's the bread of the life, a bread of the life. This didn't come at any surprise. Josephus wrote and about that time. He said, the, about the time Christ was born, the world, and the, especially the Jewish nation, was looking for a governor, a ruler, to come out of Judah that would rule the world. Just about the time he was born. And it says in Galatians, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son to be born of a woman. amazing you know all of you people that know me know I love the babies all of you know the first place I, I go when I get church I check out the nursery I got to see all those little babies I love those little babies especially when they get big enough their head don't fall over you know when they're little bitty I'm kind of scared of them you know because you pick them up and they go uh -huh. you know and I'm afraid it's gonna fall over but you know but when they get to where they can kind of hold their head up boy I like those little babies but do you know what? And I've held a lot of little babies. But can you imagine what it would be like to pick up the creator of heaven and earth, the eternal God, and hold him in your hand? Whew. Now listen, that's not the first time Christ came to earth. You see, he was here many times before that. But he came in other forms. You see, God can't come to planet earth unless he puts a veil on. Now, when he would come to planet Earth, it was called a, a pit, uh, I can't remember the, the name. There's a name for it, and I'll think of it in a minute. But he would come as an angel, or he would come in the form of human flesh. You see, when God created Adam and Eve, the Bible says that he would come down the cool of the evening and he'd walk with them and talk with them. The Lord can't stay away from his people. Then we find that one time the Lord in the form of man, with two angels in the form of man, uh, came to see Father Abraham. And, and Father Abraham uh, killed a calf and 
and prepared a meal for them, and they sit down and visited. Can you imagine that? And there's the Lord sitting there eating and visiting with Abraham, and then he got ready to leave, and they got up, and when they left, or they went out of town or went away just a little ways, and the Lord told the two angels, he said, you know, I'm going to go back and tell my friend Abraham why we're here. See, they were there to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said, the reason I am, he said, he's my friend. And he, someday he's going to be a great nation. And not only that, he said, he raises his kids right. Listen, it's important to God you raise your kids right. And so he came back then. The, the, the Lord himself came back. And, and that's when Abraham had the contest with him. Do you remember? And he'd say, well, if there's 50 righteous and if there's 40 righteous, Another time there was a lady in the, in the time of the judges and, and, and an angel of the Lord. Now in the scriptures, anytime it says angel of the Lord, that means the Lord himself in the form of an angel. Came to this woman and said, you're going to have a son. And he said, he's to be a Nazarite from birth. And, and you're to name him Samson. Well, she went and told her husband and they came back and he wasn't there. But another day or two passed and they found this, the angel of the Lord again. And, and so they, they made a sacrifice and they killed a little goat and they, they put it on there. And the man asked the angel of the Lord, he, he said, what's your name? And the angel of the Lord said, why do you ask my name seeing it is secret? The word secret in Hebrew is the same word as wonderful. And we know that he shall be called wonderful. Mighty Counselor, Eternal God. And so they said that when they built the fire and offered the sacrifice, they said he did wondrously. As soon as they built the fire and, the, and, and began to give the sacrifice and the flames and the smoke rose up, says the angel of the Lord rose up in the smoke and went back up into glory. And Samson's daddy said, Oh, he said, we're going to die because we've seen God. Then we remember Moses, he was there on the mountain and he saw a little bush on fire. And it said that he turned aside to see why the little bush didn't burn up. And a voice said, Moses, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. And then Joshua, when he was by, the, by Jericho, it says that he looked and there was a man with a sword in his hand. And, and Joshua went over to him and said, are you fighting for us or against us? He said, nay, but as the captain of the host of Israel have I come to fight. That was the Lord himself. See, the Lord came to planet Earth many times. But you see, we would have no Savior as long as he keeps coming back as a theophany. That's the word. I'm, that just means an appearance in another form. He had to be born human. He had to become God incarnate before you'd have salvation. You say, well, why is that, Jerry? Because of the justice of God. Now, a lot of people think God can do anything. God can't do anything. God is governed by his own character. And God cannot be inconsistent of himself. In other words, for instance, God can't sin and God can't lie. That's inconsistent with his character. Keep this in mind, God is perfectly holy. God is perfectly just. Now, each one of us can be unjust. And I've given this a little analogy before. When our children were little, all you mamas, There'd be time when your little child, you'd be in the grocery store or somewhere and your little child would embarrass you, they'd throw a big fit and it'd make you so mad and you'd say, when I get you home, I'm going to wear you out. Have any of you mothers ever done that? Well, we got a few honest mamas in here. <laughs> time you get home, they look so cute because they fell asleep in the back seat of the car and they got candy all over them. You know, and you just don't do it. You know what I mean? You don't give them the whipping. See, that's not just this. But you see, God is just. And he said, the wages of sin is death. And he cannot overlook your sin, Mickey. He cannot overlook your sin. He cannot overlook your sin and remain God. But he said, here's what I can do. 
I love Mary. But he's hell bound because he's a sinner. But he said, as God, I can go to planet Earth, become flesh and blood, and I can go to an old rugged cross, and I can die and pay his sin debt. And that's exactly what he did. Isn't that something? God, creator God himself, came down and became a little baby in a manger. Not to stay in the manger. And you know, I've heard people say, someone actually said this, they said, you know, I'd like to have Jesus' little Bible that he used when he was a little kid and see where he marked all the verses as he memorized it. <laughs> he is the Word. He don't have to memorize it. He wrote it. See? He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. When he was 12 years old, he was in the temple, and there were the scribes and the lawyers, what we would call them as the theologians of the day. 12 years old, he would ask them Bible questions that they couldn't answer. Then he'd answer. Then they'd ask him questions. And he'd answer for them. How could he do that? He's God. Wouldn't it have been something? Now I want to tell you, now this did not happen because listen, there was never an idle word that went out of the mouth of Jesus. He was a man on a mission. He was a God on a mission. And he had his face set like flint towards the cross. But you know what? Wouldn't it have been interesting had this happened? when Jesus maybe was sitting by the Sea of Galilee and had his apostles there, wouldn't it have been something he'd say, fellas, in the beginning, there was me. And I created the heavens and the earth. Wouldn't it have been something? Lord, how did you do that? How did you put all those stars? And he'd explain all that. Wouldn't it have been something if he could have been there and said, now, let me tell you all about Adam. Now, here's how I made him. He said, I took that clay and I formed him and I did this and then I breathed the breath of life in his nostrils. See, they were talking to God. God was there in their midst. And we know that, but we can't really comprehend that. You know, I, I think things, I think probably different than a lot of you, but I just can't imagine Jesus ever playing patty cake when he was a baby. Now, you know, little kids, they like it. Boy, he's patty cake, he's patty cake. I think that'd bore him to death. You know, because there never was a time when he wasn't God. I believe he was different than any child that ever lived. I believe he was always serious. He was always about the Father's business. I don't believe he'd run and play like other little kids because, you see, he knew his destiny. And he knew why he was there. He was always God, even when it was a little baby in the manger. But it's amazing people's attitude towards this little baby. I want, I'd like to show you something. In Matthew, you can turn to it if you want to. Second chapter. And I was studying this, and it just amazed me, people's attitude. But, you know, people's attitude really hasn't changed. People still people. It's still human nature, and we still treat Jesus the same way they treated him back then. It says, Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And out of Micah, the book of Micah, it's foretold, it says, And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And then they quote it, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Now, I want to tell you something or show you something. Now, now, when we have the manger scene, you know, we have the shepherds there and we have three kings, don't we? Now, I'm not picking. That's all right. But, but it shows them all there at the, at the, at the uh, manger. 
Well, the wise man never worked the manger. Jesus was probably almost three years old uh, by the time they got there, and he wasn't in a manger. It says he was in a house. Now, we say the three wise men or the three kings. The Bible doesn't say anything about three. In fact, more than likely, there were a lot of them. More than likely, it was a great caravan of these people that came from these because it said it really stirred up Jerusalem. I can't imagine three people slipping in town saying, did you tell me where the kings were? I mean, here comes this, more likely, here comes this big caravan of the Magi. From Magi, we get magic that had heard that, uh, that a king, a great king had been born there. And, and, and it says that when they asked, they were going everywhere, all over Jerusalem, saying, where's the king? Where's the king that's born? Where's the baby king? And, and they didn't know anything about it. And so Herod heard of this. and said, we've come to worship the baby king that's to rule the world. Well, Herod wouldn't know where he was too, but for an altogether different reason. So now notice who he called. He called the, the priests, and the scribes, all right? Now, you know who the scribes were? They were scribes. Now, what scribes did was they copied Scripture all day long. They carefully copied Scripture. There's no telling how many times those scribes had copied that phrase in, in, in Micah, how that, the, that uh, the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem of Judea. There's no telling how many times they copied that scripture where it said that, uh, that uh, he would be born and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. There's no telling how many times they copied that over and over and over. And they said he's going to be born in Bethlehem of Judea. Now these people, all of these wise men, they came from the east, far away. They were Oriental. They might have been Chinese. We don't know. But here they come. Now the reason they say three is because of the three gifts. But that doesn't mean there were three. It just means they had three gifts that they offered. There might have been 50. We don't know how many there were. But nevertheless, they said it should be born in Bethlehem of Judea. All right, now notice what happened. Now the wise men or the, or, or the, or the magi, uh, they said we saw his star and we followed his star. Doesn't it seem amazing to you that, that God's own people, the Jews, the priests, and the scribes didn't say a star? Where? What's out there? And they were, we're going to. That's what we've been waiting for now for thousands of years. They couldn't do that. There go the wise men taking off. The scribes are still standing. The priests are still standing there. They wasn't concerned enough to go down the road just a few miles to Bethlehem to find their Messiah. You know why? They had their religion. I want to tell you something. You can study your Bible all your life and not find Christ because you're not looking for him. He can be right down the road and you don't find him because you're not looking for him. You're satisfied with your religion. You're satisfied with your church membership. You're satisfied with status quo. The scribes wouldn't even go out and look at the star and walk probably 15 miles to see the Savior that had been born into the world. Here these people had come no telling how many hundred miles following the star to find the Savior. They weren't concerned. There's people that will sing Christmas carols. They will sing Christmas cards. But they don't know Jesus. And he's not hard to find. He's near you. He's right here in this church this morning. And you know what? He came for one purpose, and that is to be your Savior. But do you know what? Let me tell you something. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, and you leave here lost, he just will never been born. This Bible and this well never been written because it don't mean a thing to you. He just well not died on the cross and rose again. He just well not have built the pearly white city as far as you're concerned. What does Christmas mean to you? I want to tell you something. They said they laid him in the manger, but if he's not in your heart, it's not going to do you any good. 
Now, when the shepherd saw him, he was a little infant. But do you know how I'm going to see him when he comes again? Not as a little infant. Do you know how you're going to see him when he comes again? Not as a little infant. Not a person that's all beaten and bloody and nailed to a cross. You're not going to see him like that. I want to tell you how you're going to see him. In about 15 minutes, I'm going to tell you how you comes. No, it won't take me that long to find it. I've already found it. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation in the kingdom of patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for, his, and for his testimony of Jesus Christ. He said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in the book, and send it into the seven churches which are in Asia, and to Ephesus, and into Samaria, and into Pergamos, and into Tyre, Tyre, and to Sardis, and Philadelphia, and into Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the, sandal, the candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about with paps with a golden girdle. And his hair and his, and the, his head and his hairs were white as wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were as flames of fire, and his feet likened to fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell as his feet as dead. You see, the next time I see him, he's going to be in his glorified state. He's not going to be in his humanity. He's going to shine like the sun in his strength. One time I was working with a man, and when I was working for Sipes, I, I just I wasn't much more than a kid. And he was talking about the worst thing about being lost. He said, you know, I think the worst thing about being lost is you don't get to see God. I said, oh, yes, you do. I said, but you won't want to see him because I said, it's the great white throne judgment. I said, you'll stand before God in all of his power and all of his glory. And I said, then you will know who was born in the manger that first Christmas morning. I said, they won't want to see God at Judgment Day. You know, the Bible says the judgment will be so horrible that people will just want to go on to hell and just bypass the judgment and go right on to hell because they don't want to stand before him. But they must because it says, before this Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. Whew. Wouldn't it be something? than be able to look in that little manger and see that little infant and say, my Lord and my God. <coughs> Boy, that would have been something. I'll see him someday. And when we get on the other side, you know what? We'll have all eternity for us to tell, him, tell us how he created the worlds out of nothing how he got all the stars and the planets to stay in orbit. It's going to be something else. But I'll tell you what, when we see him, I asked Brother Eubanks one time, an old Bible scholar, he said, you know, he said, he always called me boy, he said, you know, boy, he said, I've had people say, well, you know, when I get to heaven, I don't know if I'll ever get to see Jesus or not because there'll be so many people around. And I said, well, what are you telling Brother Eubanks? I say, you can look any time and see the sun. And that's the way Jesus is. His brightness will just light up heaven. You see, the news said he has no moon nor sun because he, the Lamb, is the light of it. Man, it's hard to conceive that one time Jesus, God himself, come to planet Earth. It was just like other little babies. Can't you see little Jesus as he learns to walk? His little hair begins to grow. I mean, you know, it'd be, you know, you think, that's God. That's God. You know, I wonder when that Joseph and Mary would sit down to bless the food. They didn't pray, but they're far. 
He was sitting right there in the high chair. Isn't that something? How would, wouldn't it, you know, wouldn't it? Hey, boy, it'd be rough. Being, I'll tell you what, honor as I would, it'd be rough being, being raised in that family. You couldn't ever blame nothing on him. <laughs> he did. Jesus did. Hey, don't tell me that. He don't ever do nothing wrong. Oh, you think he's perfect, don't you? <laughs> yeah. It'd be rough being raised in that. You know, and never get a weapon. Boy. And not all that, how would you like to have an older brother talk to him? Ah, 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 that's not right. That's not nice. <laughs> I mean, just, you know, you got your own personal convictor there always pointing a finger at you. <laughs> now, you heard Mom say, Carrie, try here. Aren't you glad Jesus was born? Aren't you glad God came down from the glory land to provide salvation for you? I don't know why he did it. What I mean is this. I can't comprehend him loving me that much that he'd leave the throne of glory to come down to old planet Earth and suffer all the things that he suffered just so I could have eternal life. I don't comprehend it, but I believe it and I accepted it. Amen. And I'll tell you what. If you accept Jesus, the same Jesus as your Savior, you can leave here without one sin charged to your account. You can leave here saying, I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus, and I leave knowing that I have eternal life.